Good evening, OPN. How is everybody this evening? Uh, welcome to a Sunday night edition. If I could get a AV check, everybody's good. Yeah. Okay. That looks great. So we're fortunate. Uh, poor Misty has been very patient with me running around. I was on my usual well honed tight schedule and running about a half an hour behind. But I think uh, all is good now. So we're going to hop to it here. And uh, let me move some windows around. All righty. Good evening, OPN, and any other channels that might be mirroring us. Thank you for your support. It's good to see all you guys here in the room. We're really excited tonight because we have uh, the lovely Misty Hanna, otherwise known as Nebra Girl, on the chat streams. Um, she's going to talk to us tonight about a a lot of different things, mostly focusing around, you know, sustainability and permaculture, um, do it, DIY activism and things like that. Uh, we're welcoming, welcoming her from her home in South Sioux City, Nebraska. So we're getting some Midwestern input tonight. I hope Lorenzo's watching. He's next door in North Dakota, or close by in North Dakota. So um, we're grateful to have you here. Thank you for joining us tonight. Hey, thank you. This is fun. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll see if it's if it stays fun. I'll try to keep it that way. So, kind of what we're going to do tonight is um, I'm going to have a little little slideshow running beside as Misty is talking. Um, that's why the screen is half size. So, we'll let that roll a little bit, and then I'll uh, put them back put it back full screen and all that but I thought it would be interesting to have some visual texture to the things you're doing because you know you're involved in so many different things and they're quite lovely so I'm gonna go ahead and start that up and um, then we'll launch right in so Misty welcome again why don't you introduce yourself better than I did and tell <laughs> us a little bit about your background um, I really don't know how I could really upstand that one. That was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you can uh, give us a indication of the region you live in. You know, place your geography for people because later on in the show, this is going to become very important. Uh, where you're located in the Midwest, the surrounding states, and that sort of thing. Right. I'm actually in the northeast um, part of Nebraska, um, right across the river from Sioux City, Iowa. And I sit in the middle, basically, where three states come together. Um, you know, South Dakota, Iowa, and Nebraska. And it's where all three of them come together, right at the river. Okay. And you've lived in this area for how long? Um, well, I was born in this area, but then I moved um, when I was a child. My parents moved to Amarillo, Texas, and we were in Amarillo for about 21 years, 22 years, and we moved back here to Sioux City um, in 91. Okay, in 91. So you've been there quite a good good while, um, right. so you can, you can speak about rootedness of place and things, which is one of the things I wanted to touch on and I'm really excited to to have you here uh, we we have been wanting to interview people on local issues local solutions to global problems and in researching your stuff you know you're just a perfect example of what we're trying to do here on OPN so thank you for joining us let me I need to make sure I got okay that's good yeah um, so why don't we launch into what your primary areas of interest are? Um, I I you know looked at the blogs and looked at the websites and all that, but I would like for you to tell the people what are your primary areas of interest, the things that you're interested in around your community and in your life. Um, I'm mostly interested, as most of you pretty much can imagine, in regards to gardening. Um, I'm more of into the organic gardening rather than um, anything else. You know, I try to do everything that we can um, in our garden organically. Um, I'm interested in community, um, you know, what's going on with my community, whether it be the community gardens, um, whether it be, um, you know, getting interested in, in 
different community aspects such as like your um, housing and um, your social programs. Okay, um, good. And from your your background and your upbringing or your life experience, what sparked your interest in these particular areas? How did you come to be so active in uh, gardening and permaculture and sustainability and community service? Um, a lot of it comes basically from my parents because my parents have always been this way. They've always been very active socially. Um, they've always cared about other people. You know, if there was somebody in need, my parents were there to help out. Um, so it's just something that's always been instilled in me since I was a kid. Excellent. And I, I know there's a possibility your dad might be watching tonight, so we want to say hello to Misty's dad if he's here. I hope you're able <laughs> to enjoy this with us. We're really excited to have her on. So thank you for, for letting us have Misty for the evening. And also um, to Mr. Misty, who I know is it probably at home too and for giving up a, a little bit of time this evening. We appreciate all the investments that the spouses and partners invest in people who do these things with us. So um, pass oh, that definitely. on. Is he watching Most by the way or is he? Um, he's actually sitting right here beside me. So, oh, I tell um, him though. He's been he... absolutely fantastic. Yeah, so. well he can lean uh, in and we can say hi to him <laughs> if he wants to introduce himself. Yeah, I don't not quite sure what he's doing over he's there. He's so. Midwestern camera shy, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> That's great. Um, why don't you give us a couple of specific examples of personal and local work you've done around your interests? Like you just min mentioned community gardens and uh, maybe some social programs. So why don't you tell us just one or two examples of things you're involved with there on a regular basis? Um, I try to stay involved as much as possible, you know, um, whether it be through um, the uh, community food bank. Um, we, you know, try to help donate um, as much as we can to them. And we do have a food bank just kitty corner from my house here so we help them with the upkeep of their of their lawn and with the upkeep of the building you know we make sure their gutters are cleaned out for them stuff like that mm -hmm. um, you know there was um, not too long ago you know we had a women's shelter that was in need um, because all of their things in their storage had gotten uh, taken um, somebody broke into the storage, and so I just, you know, went through the house and tried to do what I could to donate what I could and, you know, got on the bandwagon, thank goodness for Facebook, because it allowed me to be able to get the word out and get some help to those, you know, to the people that needed it. Right. Um, and let's talk a little bit about the uh, the food pantry. Is that, well, first of all, how big is the town you live in? What's the population, roughly? Um, the population of South Sioux itself, I don't know, I would say probably 13,000. Yeah, so fairly small. And is it basically rural or does it have like a town center and then surrounding farm areas? Um, you know, kind of give us that light. Where, how's the population density assigned there? Well, you know, if you look at the tri-state Siouxland area, I mean, there's over 35, 37,000 people here in, just in the, this area. So um, where we're located at in, is it that big? Um, where we're located at, oh, 100 and some? Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> My oh, that's okay. Said, oh, I was way low. <laughs> so, um, you, know, you know, over 100,000 people just in the tri-state area. So, you know, where I'm actually at in South Sioux is just a small portion of it. It's like a suburb. Mm -hmm. But a, a tri-state area covers a lot of square miles and a lot of little towns. And the, the reason I'm getting to this is that you have a fairly small and accessible community, but the needs of the community are similar to needs of every other community. Um, thus, you have you have a, a food pantry there. Um, I was wondering if you might know, because food security and food justice is one of the things we're interested in. Mm -hmm. In the little county I live in, you know, there's probably a population of 20,000 in the county, and we know that statistically 25% of the people are food insecure. 
So the community mm -hmm. kitchen I work with and the gardens I work with. And would you say that you have any feel for for what the food security situation is in your area? Um, how how active is the 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 food pantry and the community kitchen? Um, it's extremely active. Um, that's the one good thing about our area because we are very community minded here, and everybody in the community gives to them when they you know when they say hey we need help. Um, so you know I would have to say that that percentage is probably accurate. Uh -huh. It might be a little bit higher, um, maybe around the thirty percent range. Um, but you know it's it's like any other city. You know we do we do have a need for it most definitely. Right, um, and I when I got involved in that particular area of interest, I was really stunned. I mean, that's a high percentage. That's one in every three or four people that have food security issues, which means accessibility, affordability, uh, quality, right. or and, and it's a huge issue, right? And and who knows? It's sure. like one of those dirty little secrets of our country. Well, exactly, and they want to keep it in the back burner. They don't want people to know how badly it, it really is, you know, and how many, you know, the the percentages of people who actually are going hungry. You know, if you look at how many children are actually on a breakfast program or a lunch program in these cities, you know, it, it's amazing and it's high. It's it's very high. It shouldn't be. It, yeah, and so... Really, really good. Now, in your food pantry, do you guys distribute um, like canned goods and dry goods, or do you have fresh produce in season? How does your can you describe sort of how your food pantry community kitchen works? Um, sure. Um, now we have a couple of uh, different um, distribution centers um, in the area, um, and basically, it is it's dry goods, it's canned goods, it's meat. Um, and you know fresh produce if you know you can donate fresh produce to them they'll definitely take it um, they have you know several restaurants that will donate whether it be rolls or um, donuts or bread and things like that for them um, great and is the uh, that operation is that fully staffed by volunteers or are there paid employees or is it all just community activism and volunteers um, I do believe that there are probably a few people that are paid, um, like through the Salvation Army and that, but um, a lot of it is just done through volunteerism. Right. And what about funding for that sort of thing in your area? Is it um, Does it get any state and local funding, or is it mostly donations and support of people who our our thing is it's okay to share, there's enough for everybody? So almost everything we do is fully funded locally. Um, right. What about your situation? Um, I'm not exactly sure how they're they're funded. I do know um, that they do rely quite heavily in regards to um, the local community helping to support them and you know to whether it be by money or by food donation. Um, so, but as far as you know how that is actually distributed through the state government or the city I don't know okay um, now it seems that there's a perfect tie-in between that and your interest in gardening and mm -hmm. some of the pictures we saw I'm assuming were your gardens but right. you're also involved with a um, an Occupy gardening group that um, you're coordinating via Facebook, and what about local community gardens and things of that nature? Um, I do have some contact in regards to the community gardens. Um, we only have two here. We have one in South Sioux, and then we have one that is actually being done through a church over in Sioux City. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but my aspect is trying to just get it on a, a basic public level where we're getting the neighbors to get more involved and and get them to start growing more food at home and get them away from the chemicals. Right. Um, and how successful are you at that and what what kind of what kind of tactics do you use to help get that message out and to organize and encourage people to participate in that? Um, I talk pretty extensively in regards to Occupy Gardening and what I'm doing here at my own home. Um, 
I also have, of course, my Facebook, which I'm very active with. Um, you know, I chat with several people. Um, I share seeds. Um, you know, being in retail, I'm able to have that public um, social contact. Um, so I'm able to discuss that with, you know, hundreds of people. And just getting more people involved and getting them more interested in growing at home. And do you find that, because um, this is one of the things I'm struggling with, and it comes up a lot with a lot of people I talk to um, all over, and even the other night, Lauren and Jack, when they were doing their walk around a storefront in Long Island, they were saying how to mobilize people, you know, how to get people power, how to get volunteers. And so a lot of people, we're, we're all talking about this all the time. Do you feel it's it's most successful to have the face-to-face -face interaction with people, the one-on-one, -on -one, to have a conversation with them? Or are there other vehicles that get people ignited and excited and, and actually active, not talking about it, but actually doing it, in your case, doing a garden or doing volunteering at a community garden? Um, I think the face-to-face -face is most definitely helpful um, because you're allowed to um, be able to discuss different issues that they may have, you know, well, like, you know, you might have someone who's in an apartment complex that has no clue that they could actually grow on their balcony. Um, so to have that face-to-face -face conversation is definitely probably the best because it will allow me to be able to go, okay, well, you know what, this is what we can do. This is how you can do this. You know, and you can ever overcome a lot of those obstacles that they might have. Right. It, the whole show and tell thing, you know, people people get it if they can see it being done and you're you're able to show them. Um, why don't, you want to talk a little bit? I, I don't have an image pool specific for it, but I would love to hear a little bit about your your food production garden around your home what kind of things are you doing <laughs> like uh, you, you know how however large or small that is because this is important you know I want to encourage people that they can glow, grow a, a pot full of cherry tomatoes or whatever so what do you what do you guys do there at the uh, Casa de Misty um, we actually have basically taken over my backyard with a garden <laughs> um, we also share with our neighbor. Um, she allowed us to take her backyard, and we grew uh, tomatoes and potatoes and peppers in her yard. Um, then we also do a lot of um, container gardening. Um, we have quite an extensive um, list of containers that we do with tomatoes and um, different herbs, things like that. Um, my father, a complete genius, um, put together some uh, some raised beds that I can put on the patio. Um, so we're doing spinach and lettuce and strawberries and those. Um, we have some in the house. Um, we have containers in the house, um, such as our stevia and different herbs. Um, we're looking at um, expanding um, as regards to you know hydroponics um, to do things in more through the winter time in the house. That's so it's pretty extensive. You got a little bit going on all over the place. And oh, definitely. Uh, and from the pictures I've seen, there's a certain consideration of some aesthetics there too that you try not only to make things productive to but to make them beautiful. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. I mean, you, you, know, you still have to think about the neighbors. You know, I would love to tear up my front yard and make it all food production, but unfortunately the neighbors won't like that, so we have to make sure that it at least looks nice for the city. Yeah. <laughs> and so are you are actually pretty much right in town? You have neighbors on either side and across the street, that sort of thing? Most definitely, yep. I'm, I have neighbors on both sides of me, all around me, actually. Um, I have probably about a good acre or so of land behind my house mm -hmm. um, that's not being used. So we try to, we try to um, use some of that, you know, as far as the, the, the back side of it, you know, what we can and what the let us allow us to do. But okay, hang on just a minute. I'm opening the the question pad so I can keep up okay. with that. So sorry that I looked away because uh, oh, no, people, people are really interested in it. Um, somebody, uh, here's a good question right off the top. Somebody's asking 
about this situation on the ground in your area and around your region uh, regarding Monsanto, GMOs, and stuff like that, and what is the, the feel of the farming community in that area, because it is a farming region, uh, mm -hmm. around those issues, Monsanto, GMOs, you know, they're hot topics now. Oh, most definitely, and it's a hot topic here. You know, uh, we have some farmers that don't think anything of it, um, and, you know, they look at it as it's a, a way to be able to increase their yields. And then we also have some farmers that are totally against it, you know, and they're trying to push the message and, you know, to do things more organically and um, to get away from those, the GMO seeds and start going, you know, more, more of an organic seed. Yep. Is there much open community discussion about that kind of stuff? You need either amongst people or in the local media, newspaper, radio, TV kind of thing? Is, or is um, not so much as far as radio or TV, um, but it's definitely something that the community itself, as far as, you know, just talking to people, they're definitely more than aware of it. And, you know, most of them are against Monsanto and the GMOs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but you've had it in our food supply for so long. You know, the main problem with that is that how are you going to get away from that? You know, you've got... You know, both your parents, you know, both parents in the household are working, um, and you've got kids that are involved in different sports activities and school, things like that. And so how do you get away from being able to have those prepackaged or, you know, those, those meals that do such a cereal that contains GMOs? How do you get away from that and be able to have the time to be able to do it yourself? Right. Um, which is a really big issue, and I, I always say, well, most be, you know, some people have time, some people have money, f very few people have both. And right. that, that, you know, is raising and growing your own food and keeping it prepared and freezing and canning and all that stuff is an enormous, uh, takes an enormous amount of time. It's how I grew up. It's what my, my mom did. I mean, she, she did not work outside of the home because she was like a, a, a laborer inside the home because we had a huge garden which she tended and uh, you know we would the kids would go out and pick and everything my dad would plow and all that but for the most part the day-to-day -day maintenance of the garden was her and then in the summer we freezed and canned and we I mean, it was 12 14 hours a day in food production and preservation um, so it's a big challenge right everybody will agree okay, well, yeah, GMO stuff isn't good for me, but what can I do? And there's the million-dollar question. It's a rhetorical question. We don't have an answer. Oh, exactly. <laughs> exactly, and it is. It's the million-dollar question. You know, and it's like, where do you go? Where do you start just to get it out of our food supply? You know, you're looking at having to re-educate, you know, every single farmer that's out there, you know, and trying to get them to redo the way the the way that they've been doing things since the early 80s. Um I want to I'm trying to multitask, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fine. Um I I think it's a really good you know because this is where the conversation breaks down. You know, it's it's not that difficult to recognize the problems. It's very difficult to pull out tenable solutions because like I know just from inter in interacting with you you work a, a, a day job it eats up a lot of your time and a lot of your hours and you're, you're still trying to do the gardening th there's just not enough hours in the day so where do you make the concession or do you have to make a concession it's a challenge well, it's definitely a challenge, you know, and I've been quite lucky because I do have my husband and I do have my father, um, you know, that help. They're right there, you know, doing it with me. Um, so that's definitely a plus on my side. A lot of people won't have that. Um, and you're right, it's extremely time consuming. Um, you know, we still have a few things out in the yard now that still have to come up because um, we just haven't had the time to get out there and do it. So. Well, you just chip away and do what you, you, I say, work, use what you can, do what you can, and you just got to keep chipping, chipping away at it. And, yep. and this kind of is a good time to segue to the whole conversation about permaculture and general sustainability.
because these things are part of that conversation. So I was wondering if you could offer up um, what your definition of permaculture might be. Um, well, as far as my viewpoint on permaculture, it's basically taking the things that we already have and that we're already using and we're basically changing them to make them more compatible with nature itself and what we're doing in the garden or you know what we're doing with our forests and you know it's just like rain barrels um, or um, um, the water that we're using through our sinks and through our toilets and things, you know, how can we make that more sustainable so we're not actually wasting it? Right. Um, we did a movie night a week or so ago on the Earthships, which were Mike Reynolds projects down in New Mexico. And that's what that's gray water reclamation. I mean, they, they reclaim oh, yeah. all water. And, you know, reusing every possible thing in order to have a, a closed ecosystem that is sustainable and a perma you know the the root word of permaculture you know implies permanence it implies rootedness in place um, which is another issue in our society and our culture right because everybody moves every three years and how do you establish something well exactly exactly and that's the thing and, you know and you have to actually be able to show them how easy it actually can be and what the importance is of it um, so it's not so much um, an inconvenience in their lives you know because everybody is busy you have full-time jobs and you have children you know so you have to be able to show them um, the proactive part of it and what it's going to do for them and for you know our earth um, so in a in a a whole whole life vision, uh, what is your idealistic vision of how you would like for you and your family and your community to live? You know, um, or do you have one? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but it just <laughs> popped in my head. You just like you, everybody's got these little things, and I'm watching the chat and. Uppity mentioned something. She said a yard share because your neighbors are sharing the yard and there's a yard share. So, like, what if everybody with these backyards that were connected, if we just took down all the fences and everybody yard shared, you'd have a whole farm on the block, you know? But right. what, is, what is your what is your vision there for your yourself and your community as far as those sorts of things? Well, I think the yard share idea is absolutely fantastic. Um, I have several neighbors that we yard share with. Um, both my neighbors on both sides, we share food um, that we're all growing. Um, I have the neighbor that's two houses down from me. We share seeds for flowers and things like that. Um, I have you know family that's a few blocks up and they've got their garden growing and we share with them. Um, so I think the yard share idea is absolutely wonderful. I would love to do it and get it get it more. Um, neighborly, you know, more of a, a bigger community to do it. Mm -hmm. I think it would be fantastic. Um, um, do you guys have like community meetings or potlucks or, you know, barbecues or something where you just get together and talk about this stuff? Because I'm really interested in community organizing and what works and what doesn't. Um, actually, no, we don't. I mean, we just pretty much you know, take care of each other. And, you know, if we've got somebody new in the neighborhood that moves in, we go over and say hello to them. And, you know, we sit out on the stoops in the summertime and we talk. And, you know, we all kind of get together and just kind of hang out in the front yards and, you know, catch up with everything and look at everybody's flowers and trade plants and... <laughs> That's great. Well, that's a beginning, right? It's the, uh, I'm actually reading this huge essay right now on, on community building, and it makes the uh, point. It says that when people are surveyed, they say, you know, like, as long as they're not, you know, down at the very bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, as long as they they are not, you know, indigent and, and just suffering on a daily basis that if their basic needs are met what are the things that they miss the most and the answer is very often community and community slash social productive social interaction and 
what it speaks to is the very things that you're doing. You're sitting on the stoop and talking to somebody, sharing some seeds, and that how historically community, the interaction of people, was not an add-on. It was a way of life and survival because we had interdependence on each most other. Definitely. Yeah, most definitely. And it's and it's that way here with us. I mean, we, you know, we, during the winter time, you know, of course, we're not growing um, during the winter time, but we do still take care of each other and we still check up on each other. Um, we shovel each other's walks, you know, when we have snow and um, we just make sure that, you know, we know what's going on with the community and that we're all very active and, and we communicate. Um, good point, the communication element, like you talk and you you engage and interact and I think that's one of the things even as a person who works in new media in the digital arena I've actually done a couple of workshops lately that I think that's that's actually can be self-limiting everybody hides behind email hides behind Facebook hides behind tweets and texts it's all immediate but there's there's not enough depth to it and that these things that we need to accomplish for our health and well-being both as individuals and community, they take they take time. It's a it's a Definitely. messy it's a messy slow process, and mm -hmm. so I'm looking for examples of how that's taking place. Of which you you are one, and why I want it. It's why I'm asking so many questions about your community <laughs> and your interaction. Uh, you know what? Here's the thing. It's a matter of walking out your front door and running over and knocking on your neighbor's door and saying, "Hi, my name's Misty." You know, I mean, it's that simple. It it and somebody has to go first. That's what exactly. I say. Exactly. And um, you know, I'm not the world's greatest messenger, but if I believe somebody has to go first and nobody's going, then here I am. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, and I'm not afraid to get out there and go. Here I am. You know. <laughs> um, well. I, and I love this discussion about permaculture and sustainability because I think it's going to be the salvation of our culture and our society. And we 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 have to recognize that it's going to take s some effort. Um, I think sharing these stories and this information like this is is a good start. Um, and I I think I want to use that is a segue to set up the conversation about the Missouri floods. Um, and I, I need to pontificate just a little bit because, um, you know, when when Clearly, who, who was the person that put this show together for us, thank you, Clearly, for working with Misty and getting that all happening. Yes, thank um, you, Clearly. She has been, she's a force, you know, and we love our Clearly. Um, but she was giving me some information, and I was doing some research, and this this thing about the floods kept kept coming up, and I was like, the flood? What the floods? And as I got into it, and as we talked, and you shared some of the links with me, I think it's it's one of these things. And I was even telling my my wife about it. She had never heard of that, and we were looking at some of the images and some of the documentation from that, and it was enormous. So what I'm talking about is the Missouri River floods. Uh, oh, we might have we might have just lost the connection here. Yep, we still I got so. we still got good AV uh, there on the channel. Get a little mic check, little AV check. I want to make sure we didn't drop off. Okay here. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we're good. It, I just All got right. a pop-up that indicated. Um, and I didn't want to lose any of this. But what we're talking about is the Missouri River floods of 2011, summer 2011, uh, June, um, if my research was right, the, the area there in June. And um, I'm going to put, I'm going to make you a little bit smaller on the screen a little bit. And I'm, while you're discussing this, because there's a lot of things around it that I want to get into, um, this is like, community activism and mutual aid at its best in a disaster situation. But this is a disaster that very few people knew about except the people involved. And as I understand it, is still having some repercussions to the day. So 
Most definitely. Um, why don't you give us a little background, and I'm going to go ahead and set up this video part. and Just tell us, tell the people what the Missouri River floods were about, you know, the timing and what happened. And I'm going to start this little bit of video so people can see kind of the extent of it. Okay. Um, basically what it is is that it was due to heavy rain um, that started back in April of last year. And um, there was a huge snow melt that was going on up in Montana. And there was just too much water. And the Corps of Engineers was warned um, in regards to all the water. Um, they were asked to release um, water early, um, which didn't happen. And then what ended up happening is that basically it got so bad that in a seven state region, um, it was Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Nebraska, uh, and Kansas and Missouri um, basically flooded. I mean, anything that was along the Missouri River was flooded. Um, we had three days warning um, at the time um, to get everybody out away from the river, to get dikes built, uh, sandbags done, things like that. And so it was just, it was massive. And, you know, the, the video that's running, I don't think you can see, is actually, am I pronouncing this right, Minot? North Dakota? Yeah, that's actually, yep, that's the flooding that actually happened that occurred up in Minot uh -huh. um, in regards to their river there. Um, it's just there was no place for their water to go. Right. Um, and I had other, other like, aerial videos of uh, the Missouri River flooding, like, around Omaha and places like that. So I want to make the point. Seven state, seven state, and I want everybody to look at the, the view there now. As far as you can see in any direction, those houses are underwater. You can see the waters all the way up to the rooftops. Um, it, it was astonishing the scope and the scale of the damage. And even more so, you can watch this video and you see it was beautiful weather. Yeah, this oh, yeah. this was not this was not like a hurricane sandy storm that the storm rolled in from the ocean. This was natural heavy snow runoff that was not controlled well by the Corps of Engineers because that's your government at work. But it destroyed tens of thousands of acres and just unlimited number of homes um, along these areas. Um, do we know, I didn't get a chance to get any statistics, but roughly how many people were affected? Do, is there a number? Um, I don't know if they ever really released the total number of people that were affected. Um, I know that there was, you know, I think would they say close to 20 million acres of farmland that was completely destroyed. And that's food producing farmland. Right. That, that was destroyed and, and not recoverable for, you know, years and years when we, we have these floods as the people up in the northeast are experiencing from the flood damage in Sandia. Floods come with all kinds of, of issues that are involved. So, you know, it's this, the thing is, I want to know, how is it that we didn't know about this? Um, you know, we pretty much asked the same question. Um, you know, we tried very hard to get the word out. You know, we hit all the major news stations. Um, we were online. You know, we were furious about it because nobody was actually reporting this. Nobody was reporting that these people were losing their homes and businesses were being wiped out and cities are being wiped out. You know, there's farm animals that were, you know, that were killed. Um, you know, because they drowned. Um, but there was nobody that was in the major news cycle that was actually paying attention to what was going on with us. You know, even the Weather Channel themselves, you know, they had a little blip about it, and then they let it go. Um, and, and it astonishes me as I was researching this, because I call myself fairly aware and fairly wide read, and, and I, I, you know, this was all new to me. And the only thing I could think of is, all these poor people, how much help that they needed at the time, and still do, 
and I want to get into that in a little bit, but how it, it, it's just criminal that the major media wasn't all over this, that there wasn't the same outcry for assistance there that there was for Katrina, you know, rightly so, and also for, you know, comparing it to Hurricane Sandy and the Sandy Relief Aid, you know, it was just, it was completely invisible. And the people in the region were left to fend for themselves. Oh, most definitely. You know, and that's where we kind of stepped in in our community. Um, you know, there was thousands of us, you know, we stepped up and we were like, okay, you know, we had sandbagging parties, you know, we went and um, helped coordinate to get people out of their houses so they didn't lose everything that they had. You know, we did the best we could as a community. You know, when you're looking over 100,000 people that are going to be, you know, affected by this, just in one small area. This doesn't include a seven state area. This is just in my area. Um, it was just, it was amazing um, for what we did. Um, so why don't we talk about what you did, um, what your community did, what your neighbors did, what your friends did. Um, let's talk about how people, what relief was offered, how many meals, to, let's, let's hear about Let's hear about the Missouri River flood relief effort. Um, well, I have to give kudos to Judy um, for setting this up because she's the one who started this all. And we all kind of came together on a Facebook page that Judy had started. And we were coordinating by cell phone and by Facebook um, and through the city managers and coordinators through them. And we were able to help with sandbagging efforts. You know, anybody who was along the river area that we knew was going to be flooded, we were there. We were helping them move things to higher ground. We were um, coordinating food drop-offs to, like, National Guard folks and water drop-off. Because keep in mind, this is, you know, June and July that this is all happening. And so, you know, we had to make sure that everybody was taken care of. And so, you know, people just stepped up. You know, they were going to Walmart and buying all the water out and just taking it down the streets and handing it out to people. Um, and um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you were involved with a group that did some meal service, or am, am I misspeaking there? Um, yeah, I was. Um, we have our Stand Proud group, um, Siouxland Flood group, and... Um, we basically helped to coordinate with the sandbagging. You know, anybody that needed help, we had volunteers that were getting onto the Facebook page or calling in um, on their cells, and they were like, okay, where do you need us? And we would send them to different places that was needed. If somebody needed food, we had somebody going and getting food and dropping food off to them. Um, if, you know, if somebody needed help moving, um, we had people that would, you know, go and help move. Um, it was a coordinated effort by the whole community, to be honest with you. But, I mean, I was just a, a part of that, you know, and I just got lucky, I guess. But um. Well, it's, you know, I think it's an interesting thing, and we, we see this with Sandy Aid, and also this has been an example, about how fast people can respond, how quickly they can come together, and how effective they can be in times of disaster. Um. Just, yeah, most definitely. I mean, you know, you had a whole community of people that came together and, you know, we went down um, to our Civic Center area is where they staged it. You know, we all got together no matter, you know, race, creed, color or anything. We were just all there as a community to help our community. And we did sandbagging and put together thousands and thousands of sandbags, you know. And it was, you know, whatever community needed us, we were sending people there or we were going there. Um, it was, you know, very chaotic. You know, we were trying to keep up, like, with my dad and I, um, and a couple others were um, always taking pictures. We had certain uh, places throughout the area that where we could actually watch the water rise and be able to keep track of it. Mm -hmm. um, and what was the, um, the government agency responses during the, the run-up? Because you, you said... I mean, people saw this coming. You had at least three days notice. Nobody knew how bad it was going to be. But there was some awareness that something was not going to be good. Um, 
what was the response of the government agencies, or did you guys end up just bearing that burden, uh, at least on the front end, for yourself? And and then also, I'm interested about the aftermath. Um, you know, our government here, as far as Sioux City and South Sioux, um, Dakota Dunes, um, we were they were definitely involved in this. I mean, they were down there every day, you know, helping out side by side, helping us with sandbags. You know, when you've got the mayor of your city down there sandbagging with you, you know, that kind of says a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, the community government itself was on top of it. Um, as far as, you know, state governments, um, I have to say, you know, like the governor of South Dakota was absolutely fabulous. Um, he was on top of it. You know, um, our governor here in Iowa was, was pretty much on top of it. Um, I don't know about the Nebraska governor. I'm sure he was on top of that. Um, most of the coordination that I was involved with I wrapped around the city part of it, not so much a state. Mm -hmm. And what about federal responses? Were there like FEMA or any of those kinds of groups, or did you get any assistance from them? Or <laughs> well, yeah, FEMA was here um, after it all happened, <laughs> and the water, you know, was already doing its damage. You know, we we had just across the river from me, a few miles up, we had one whole community development that was basically wiped. Um, it was like 160 homes, I believe it was, and they were totally destroyed. And it was because, you know, they forgot it was there. Um, so, you know, they were there. FEMA did come in, but um, they pretty much sat on their hands on that. And, you know, FEMA is not exactly well-liked in this area. <laughs> I, I don't know that they're well liked anywhere. I mean, every every opportunity they get, they kind of fumble it. So, um, yeah. you know, uh, which is it's not my my goal to to bash bash organizations and institutions. It is my goal to illustrate how effective ordinary people can be. Ordinary right. people who will do extraordinary things. Ordinary right. people who rise up and band together. And that's the object lesson of this. You know, the institutions that we depend on repeatedly fail us. People banding together is what is going to be our survival as a society. And people banding together and working together is going to be what brings us out of the mess we're in. And everything you speak to, um, from the gardening at your house to the community activism around the floods points to that. I mean, how many illustrations do we need, right? Right, exactly. Um, and I think a lot of it, too, is just a matter of getting away from the whole concept of me. You know, because life isn't just about me. It, life is about my neighbor and, you know, the people that live two blocks down from me. Um, so, you know, once we get out of our own little bubble um, and start looking at the big picture, you know, I don't want my neighbor to starve. I don't want the people two blocks away from me to starve or the person that's across town to starve. You know, if somebody needs food, we need to make sure that they're taken care of. You know, and, you know, if you want to call me a socialist, I'm a socialist, I guess, you know, but that's just the way it is. It's, it's better that we take care of our neighbors and take care of our community um, than to have to rely on the government to do it. Um, yeah, and if that's socialism, I say embrace it wholeheartedly. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, I have these same conversations. You know, we, we, we are a culture of independence, and so there's a lot of energy and effort put into maintaining it or the illusion of it and all that, and I think it, it fails us. You know, we just basic human interaction has been degraded to the point because you know the, in, the individual is celebrated over the community and I'm not saying we should we should all abdicate our individuality I'm saying we should use it for good instead of evil <laughs> I totally agree with you I mean you know once we get up in the mindset that it's such a bad thing to be community organized you know I think that um, the communities themselves can definitely prosper 
Um, it's just a matter of getting out away from that me bubble. Right. Um, it's a good point. If nothing else this evening, there was the gold nugget right there, getting away exactly. from the me bubble. I love that. So um, can you tell us, it's been a, uh, over a year, so almost a year and a half since the floods. What are some of the lasting repercussions of it in the area? Um, in my area, um, we still have um, a few communities that are still trying to rebuild. I mean, we have um, like Riverland, which is just a couple miles up the highway, um, that are having to basically rebuild from the bottom up. And so, you know, we have houses here along the river, um, here in South Sioux, that are trying to rebuild um, because we lost 10 houses just here in South Sioux. Mm -hmm. um, so those people are trying to rebuild and of course you know you've got city um, issues that go along with that because you know you've got sidewalks that are buckled you've got basements that are having to be rebuilt um, so there's a lot of things that go into play with that um, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of trees um, all along the Missouri River from you know Montana down to Kansas and Missouri that are completely lost mm -hmm. Um, which, you know, trees are our life source. Um, you, we need them for oxygen and for cleaning the water and what have you. Right. So still a great deal of recovery that, that needs to happen. And so I would encourage all of us, you know, our, our role we can play in it is part of the chatters and viewers here. Now that we know the stories, we need to share them because people are educated via stories um, and exposure and it's an easy conversation to have with somebody and say look at what these people have suffered through we need to mobilize and help them any way we can and if we get those stories spread far and wide reasonable people won't tolerate that you know you look exactly. at you look at the response of of for the sandy aid which right. is, is a model example how phenomenal that has been because reasonable people will not tolerate that happening to their their fellow people. Well, um, exactly. You know, and keep in mind that the floods that happened here just along the Missouri, which they call it like the 500-year flood, um, was before Occupy had become a known name. You know, this was before anybody even knew about Occupy. Um, so we didn't have that that large social media um, at that point in time, you know, that has expanded as much as it has. Right. Well, you know, we need to leverage the media for good, and this is a good way to use it, you know, to share the stories, to focus on on needs and solutions, and um, to, to help people shorten the distance between ideas and actions. And also, it, it's such a pleasure to be talking to you because it just reinforces my opinion that all of us are more alike than we might might imagine you know I'm, I'm having this conversation with you uh, in Nebraska the same issues involve my region I see people on here from small towns that are watching and they're chiming in I see people from the middle of New York saying you know it's this everybody's up against the same things and we if we share these skills and we share this information and we share support we can learn from each other and be able to to make things better so this is this is vitally important that we oh, do definitely this. yeah most definitely you know and like i said it's just a matter of getting outside the door you know and and just looking around and going okay what can i do to make somebody else's life better you know, whether it is donating to a women's shelter um, or donating food to your local food pantry, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing that because the outcome of it is can only be positive for your for your community. Right. You know, because you're giving somebody the opportunity to be able to have a hand up, you know, and be able to step up. Right, and uh, there's a, a chatter that just made a statement, and I want to read this out because I think it's really good. Good stories do not sell commercials. Negative stories do because they remind us how we need something that a corporation is often offering for a price. So people, people are so conditioned 
to only hearing negative stories and failures and you know here you have a problem you have a problem here we can solve it for for 9.99 or whatever right. you know, to be sold something but but when you are having conversations like we're having now with all the things you do, that transcends economics and it transcends money and it transcends exchange because it's about human to human helping and nobody can make money off of that and that's exactly. the beautiful thing about it um you, you just look at i mean again just all kinds of mutual aid how everybody involved benefits because of the spirit of generosity you know needs being met but everybody contributing. It's so important. If we can do nothing but encourage that on a on on a small basis, but also on a large basis, we oh, will a accomplish a lot. So I want to get Most to um, what lessons have you learned from from your experiences in in both of these segments we've been talking about. You know, around your town and your community, the gardening, the permaculture, how that tied in to the floods and the rivers. What what lessons are, have you learned that you would like to share from all these experiences you've collected over the years? Um, I think that it's just a matter of not being afraid to talk to people. And, you know, there was a... a a poster that had come out not too long ago that I had posted, and it was basically, everybody has a story. And if we just stopped and listened to the story, rather than judging, um, you know, and just listening to people, it's amazing what, can, what we can do. The listening is a big part. I, I love that. I, I don't do enough of it myself, and I'm trying harder. <laughs> but it's so important, you know, to listen to other people's stories. I mean, we'll have time to tell our own, right? Everybody oh, gets a chance. Yep. But to listen to people's stories, to understand where they come from, why they're th what they're thinking, why they're feeling that way, to have an exchange and, and to make human connection. Most definitely. And that's what it's about, just making the connection. Because once the connection is made, then all of the fear kind of falls to the wayside for the most part. You know, at that point, you you take it as a human. There's a human in front of you. There's somebody, you know, with flesh and with needs um, that is in front of you. Mm -hmm. And so once you get that connection, that's where it all starts. Excellent. And, you know, I, I say lately, I find myself saying more and more, we have to make it personal. You know, the powers that be, the big organizations, the banks, the governments, the everything, they they want it to be abstract because abstract eliminates the humanity. Our job is to make it personal. Our job exactly. is to make what a bank does to a person on foreclosure a personal issue. Exactly. A hungry person exactly. is a personal issue. If we make it personal and we discuss it on a personal level using the media to get the words the stories out don't do it in abstract you know do it as this happened to this person this happened to misty you know this misty's a nice person this is misty's family this is misty's yard and garden and dogs and you know this is misty's community it becomes personal and we can relate to it exactly exactly and that's where it comes down to you know once you make it personal then at that point, it becomes a community issue. You know, it's a community activi activism right there. Um, and at that point, then you, you know, you start caring what happens to that person because that person's in your community. You know their name. You know their face. Right. Exactly. Um, and then that's when things, positive things, start happening. Definitely. Um Pretty much my last my last question, and then um, I'm going to ask a couple of more questions that are on the pad. So anybody that's um, watching, if you have questions for Misty that you want me to relay, if you'll put it on the pad, I'll I'll get to them. But um, just in general, what are your observations on the necessity of developing, using, 
and sharing do-it-yourself skills and a need to encourage a mindset of sustainability? Um, I think it's extremely important. Um, you know, my mother um, was one of those that did all her own baking. Um, you never, you know, she'd come home from work and she was in the kitchen and she baked. Everything was done by hand. Um, you know, her whole point with us was teaching us kids how to be able to rely on our the things that were around us, such as crafting and um, crocheting or canning or you know gardening. My mother was huge on gardening. Um, so I think it's extremely important that once we get back to the basics and we actually get away from the whole consumerism in itself um, and we learn to do things on our own, then we start becoming more self-sufficient. Um, and I agree with it, and I, I feel like self-sufficiency is a powerful weapon against the status quo. Oh, definitely. <laughs> they will do anything possible to keep us from being self-sufficient because that threatens everything they're about. And you can see it like the example of Bloomberg starting to lean down on the aid centers and things like that. They do not want us to take care of ourselves. No, exactly. And, you know, and I think it's a shame. I just saw that right before um, the show so started, and I just wanted to die. I wanted to cry. Those poor people. You know, I can't even imagine. So that's our, in response to and in spite of the repression, we need to be self-sufficient because exactly. that's how we win. <laughs> yep, um, yep. Do you have any closing comments you'd like to leave for the crowd? No, I'm just really glad that you allowed me to do this. I think it's fantastic. Um, we uh, you know, do have our Occupy Gardening site, um, so everybody can go check us out at Occupy Gardening on Facebook. Um, I am looking at um, you know, throwing out the live stream um, with um, Butterfly and Pez and Zeno and um, Murtis, um, trying to get the live stream up and going. Mm -hmm. So um, they've been absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, without them, I wouldn't be where I am right now with Occupy Gardening. Yeah. Well, you know, everybody's everybody's here to help, and any any assistance we can render, we'll be glad to. I want to ask a couple of quick questions that are in the pad. Okay. And uh, if you have a moment, first, uh, somebody asked, do you have a lot of medicinal herbs in your your herb garden? <laughs> um, I guess it really depends on what you qualify as what medicinal you, herbs. What your defi definition <laughs> yeah. Like, how about mint and comfrey and all that kind of stuff? <laughs> I do have mint. <laughs> um, and then the uh, uh, one chatter asked, as a result of the flooding, I'm guessing, you know, and the issues around with that, are there more or less seasonal flu symptoms in your region? Like, have you seen any increase in health issues due to the flooding? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's not something that's been um, public, you know, as far as public knowledge goes. Um, you know, we're like any other part of the country. You know, we have our flu seasons. Um, we have issues um, with um, rotavirus, things like that. I mean, your normal, you know, your normal... Yeah stuff right so so no ginormous increase which we can be grateful for so oh most definitely so um i think with that we're going to um let you go and get back to your evening because i know your time is precious um if the chatters want to hang on i'll be back on live in just a moment with some announcements and all that misty thank you so much for being here tonight Oh, and thank for you. It all was the so good things fun. you're doing, and people loved loved it. There are just you know lots of new viewers, lots of people with positive comments, and uh, keep up the good works and the good attitude. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I absolutely had a ball. I was really nervous in the beginning, but I'm just glad that I did it. Now it's awesome. <laughs> okay, well we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a good week. Okay, thank you.